King Hill Presbyterian Church on this Back to School Sunday. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us on this Lord's Day. A few announcements to take note of. First, um, you might notice that you can see things a little bit clearer, clearer hopefully, um, on this recording. We have a new HD camera, uh, but we also want to give a disclaimer and apologize in advance for any video or audio issues since this is our first time using it. Second, we would love to welcome Sarah Wright as our cantor for this service. And also, um, just a reminder, this evening we will have evening vespers at 7 o'clock. Um, and we will be um, also celebrating Back to School Sunday at that Vesper service. Brandon Rice will be our musician uh, for that service. And we will be doing a blessing of the students and also of teachers. So we hope that you will join us, especially if you have a student or teacher in your family. Make sure to bring your mask and your chairs or blanket. And finally, on this Back to School Sunday, we want to highlight some of our new um, and also regular mission opportunities um, that pertain to our school partnerships. Um, the first um, is in partnership um, with our partner in education, Mary B. Austin. We are looking for seven church members to serve as shepherds for the teachers and in each grade at Mary B. Austin. We can't go in person to volunteer, so the first quarter our focus will be on supporting the faculty and staff at Mary B. Austin. A shepherd will volunteer to write letters and send eight emails to three or four teachers in a particular grade level to encourage them. The shepherds will commit to pray for those three or four teachers and to communicate with them about ways that the church can support them during this time of online learning. If you're interested in being a shepherd, you can contact Buzz or Buddy Porter. Our second mission opportunity um, that is coming up is that we are going to spruce up the campus of Mary B. Austin for, um, with a work day on Saturday, September 19th. And finally, you can still sign up to be a big brother or big sister um, through um, that partnership. Um, and we hope that you will consider that as a way to support students during this time. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to spend an hour a week um, with a special student and to foster a friendship. And they're still looking for bigs um, during this time when um, we can't be in the schools. You can still meet with your littles um, by phone and virtually. Um, and so we hope that you will prayerfully um, think about that as well. With all that is going on at the start of school, let us begin um, in prayer. Almighty God, you have made us in all things to serve you. Now prepare the world for your rule. Come quickly to save us so that wars and violence shall end and your children may live in peace honoring one another with justice and love. Through Jesus Christ, who lives in power with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together in singing, Praise the Source of Faith and Learning, which is printed in the bulletin that you can access online. Source of faith and learning who has 
It's become a tradition here at Spring Hill Presbyterian Church on Back to School Sunday to sing that as our opening hymn, Praise the Source of Faith and Learning. Praise the Source of Faith and Learning as we gather together to renew our minds and to renew our hearts. We know that the source, the beginning, the wellspring of all that we are and all the gifts that we are given is God and God alone. God is the source of faith and learning. God is the source of our very lives. God is the source of all creativity and intelligence, of all the gifts that we have to give and to use in the world. And so we're called not only to praise, but in our praise, to live lives of grateful discipleship and of responsible and prayerful stewardship as well. And so let us return to God, the source of faith and learning. Let us return the gifts of our lives. You can participate in our offering this week through so many different methods. Uh, of course, we ask that you continue to use our online giving platform that you can access through our church website. You can mail church, uh, uh, checks or, or, or envelopes to the church office. And uh, on our Sunday night evening Vesper services, you can also bring your offering directly to, uh, to worship with you if you'd like. Friends, for all the different ways that we give of our lives and give back to God our source, let us now stop and pray. Gracious God, all that we are comes from you alone and belongs to you and returns to you in the end. And so help us as we live this life of faith and learning to live generously, to give responsibly. God, help us to use our gifts in service to your kingdom. We pray for the offering received this week, not just through the financial gifts, but through all of the gifts that you have given us, that you would use them as we together serve the world and become more and more the image of Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, kids. This is time in our worship service that is uh, designed for you in particular. And so I hope that you'll pay attention and uh, know that we are thinking of you, especially uh, those of you who have already started back to school or those of you who are starting back to school next week. This is a really uh, exciting time, but also a strange time. Going back to school during the coronavirus, it means we have to do all sorts of things like wear masks or not be able to participate in things the way we normally would. Or for some of us, it means uh, going back to school without actually setting foot in the building, but doing school online, using computers, and just seeing a picture of our teacher teaching us on the screen but not actually able to see him or her in person. It's, it's not the way we normally do things, but it's still learning. It's still teaching. God is still teaching us even during this strange, strange time. God teaching us lessons to learn. In the scripture reading that we're going to hear today, we're going to learn about God, another way of seeing God as a teacher who specifically teaches peace. God teaching us peace. Now what do you think peace means? Peace. Have you ever had a parent say, I want some peace and quiet? Well, that might give you one idea of what peace means. Sometimes people talk about peace as the opposite of war. Another one of our scripture readings today will do that. Peace and war as two different ideas, so not fighting each other. In the Bible, there's a big word in, well, well it's not really that big, but it's a different word because it's in another language in Hebrew. That word is shalom. Shalom. Can you say that at home? Shalom. Shalom means peace. It's the peace of God that's about us living and loving everybody and treating everyone the way that we're supposed to be treated. I have something, uh, it's, a, it's something really tiny, and, and I know you wouldn't be able to see this on the camera until this week. You might be able to see this because of our new uh, fancy camera that we're using, but it's really small, so if you can't, that's okay. I'm going to hold it up. It might be really hard to see, but this is something that sits on my desk. It was given to me as a gift by a friend to remind me about God's peace, God's shalom, and it's something that helps teach me. This is a cross, a little metal cross, but it's actually made out of the shell casing from a bullet. Someone took the used part of a bullet that had been shot out of a gun, and this artist cut and changed the bullet into a little tiny statue of a cross to remind us of God's peace in a world of violence, a world where Unfortunately, if you've been seeing the news, you know that right now we're, we're hearing a lot of stories about people using bullets to hurt people or to kill people. But this little bullet turned into a cross reminds me that even in a very violent world, God's peace can change things, can transform things. We're going to hear a really cool uh, a way that, uh, that that happens in our story today, or our, our Bible reading today about uh, God, it says, transforming swords into plowshares. That's kind of like saying God uh, changing a sword, a weapon to fight with, into a shovel, something to use to plant a garden with instead. God transforming. All right, so I hope that you'll come tonight to our Sunday evening Vesper service at 7 o'clock that we already heard about. And when you come, we have a special gift for each and every one of you. This is something, it's, it's designed to, uh, to, it's a tag that can go on your backpack uh, if you've started going back to school or when you do. Or maybe you could hang it up in your car uh, as you, you think about uh, school in a different place. Or maybe you want to put it on your desk at home, wherever you're, you're going to be doing online schooling. It's a prayer. On the front, it says, blessed to be a blessing. That's a great reminder for us. But on the back, it has a special prayer for students. And so I thought this would be our prayer today. All right? So we'll, um, it's kind of long, so we won't do a repeat after me, but we'll, we'll say amen together at the end. All right? Let us pray. Oh, God, bless all students this day. 
Give us inquiring minds and loving hearts. Give us the gifts of joy and wonder in all things. Give us courage and guidance to face each day. Give us laughter and love to share with all. Give us trust in your unfailing love. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, and we'll see you again next week. Let us turn to God in prayer. God, in the midst of all of the pain, heartache, and unknown in life, send your peace, which passes all understanding, to fill our hearts. Create in us a sense of peace that does not lead to acceptance of injustice, but gives us hope, strength, and courage to build your kingdom on this earth. And now, may your word instruct us, fill us with vision, and lead us on your path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 and 8. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time for war and a time for peace. And now from Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many peoples 
shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways, and that we may walk in the Lord's path. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On this back to school Sunday, I polled students. What is the one thing you want to learn this year? I thought I would get answers related to subjects in school, and a few responded in that way. But others talked about how they wanted to learn to fly, patience, skills to make our lives better, how TVs and computers work, how to understand people. And so then I polled teachers, what is the one thing you want students to learn this year? Teachers, of course, couldn't give me one answer. They wrote about how they wanted children to learn to love and be loved and return, that it's a grown-up's job to worry and solve problems, and theirs to have fun and be a kid. They want their students to learn grace, patience, kindness and understanding, to have faith that God is with them in this trying time, to know that nothing will ever divide us, even a pandemic. One teacher wrote, I want them to learn and put into practice compassion, patience, empathy, and to be fearless in the face of adversity. I want them to understand who they are and where they come from, and to remember they have a commitment to each other and the future. I hope this next generation of youth takes action with integrity, morals, congeniality, and a sense of purpose. Our students and teachers don't only want to learn and teach practical skills. Their hope in what they learn and teach goes much deeper into lessons that last that change lives and put into practice what they learn and teach. They want to learn and impart holy wisdom. Quaholit, the writer of Ecclesiastes, wrestles with what is holy wisdom. What are we to learn on this earth? What is the point of life? His response is practical. Some call him cynical. But in 2020, I would say Quaholit states the facts. In our world, there are times of war and of peace. Quaholit isn't condoning war, but acknowledges war is a part of our reality. War and violence is all around us. It makes me wonder, has there ever been a time of world peace, of shalom? There's always some sort of violence happening, some sort of unrest, some kind of division and inequality. Do we even know what peace is if we do not see it around us? Can we learn to live in God's peace in a violent, war-torn world? This year does not seem like the time for peace when all around us people are losing their jobs, people are sick, and dying. Politically, there is fighting and division, and this discord seems to radiate outward. Peace. Peace? How can we talk about peace in a time like this? Friends, now is exactly the time we must talk and learn to live in peace. Our text from Isaiah is a word that Isaiah sees. He sees how this world will learn God's peace. Unity, teaching, and justice bring about God's peace on this earth and in Isaiah's vision. In his vision, God's house will be established on the highest mountain, and all nations, everyone, 
will come to it for instruction. God's house is a schoolhouse. People show up to study and learn from all over. And this divine academy teaches God's divine way. People make a pilgrimage to learn not only how to talk the talk, but they come to learn how to walk the walk, walk in God's path. There is this sheer desire for divine instruction. Everyone wants to learn God's way of peace and love. And they don't want to learn from God just to have knowledge. They want to practice what they preach. They want to live out God's law, walk in God's way. God's instruction isn't something we're supposed to learn and tuck away for later. God's teachings make a difference now. It seems unbelievable that everyone, all nations, would flog to God's holy mountain school to learn. Trying to get a group of people to do anything is like herding cats or sheep. But there's unity in this desire. Everyone has perfect attendance in God's school. I believe that all people at their core long for God's peace, the peace that comes with the ending of inequality, the peace of knowing that your child and all children have enough to eat. You and those around you have a safe place to lay your head. You are able to be treated fairly and justly. Peace in knowing that our earth is cared for and not abused. A peace that enables you to live with hope. I think all of us would travel for miles and miles to learn that kind of peace, to live in God's shalom. God is not only a divine teacher, though, but judges and arbitrates. God not only speaks, but listens to the problems and concerns of the nations and people. God brings about justice, rights wrongs. God's judgment brings about transformation, a concrete response from people. It is from God's arbitration that the people respond by transforming their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Their hands do not beat swords into one another, but transform weapons of war into tools of community, nourishment, and nurture for the earth and humankind. The people will not lift up swords, and they will not learn war anymore, Isaiah says. All nations will stop militarizing. Can you imagine this? Can you see the long line of people and nations sitting God with God to talk things out so that God can bring restoration and equality to people? Can you see nations zeroing out their military spending and the pile of weapons, the bombs, guns, guns, tanks, fighter jets, nuclear weapons, waiting for us to transform them into tractors, shovels, rakes, and loppers, tools for peace and community? It sounds impossible. But I love this image of holy upcycling. I love things like Buzz's Cross, images where weapons of violence and war become transformed into tools of hope and nourishment. Artists, as you've seen, have used this passage as inspiration to transform weapons into art for generations. You can see a statue outside of the United Nations based on Isaiah 2 that shows a man beating down a sword and at the bottom of the sword is being transformed into a plowshare. At St. Louis University Chapel, there are light fixtures made from 20th century cannon shells. In the town of Berlin, Palestinian residents have begun to use empty tear gas canisters as pots for flowers in a garden, showing that life can spring from death. Mexican artist Pedro Reyes worked with Palace por Pistolas for residents to donate illegal weapons for redeemable coupons. 1,527 firearms were turned in and cast into shovels 
that were distributed to plant 1,527 1, trees. In another project, he turned discarded firearms into a fully functioning orchestra of 50 instruments. What a profound vision that bombs are turned to light, tear gas canisters hold flowers, and guns are transformed into musical instruments and shovels used to plant, trees creating beauty, life, and hope. But friends, we don't need to only reimagine our physical weapons. We need to reimagine the intangible weapons that can live inside of us and between us. Our tools of violence just aren't just physical weapons. If only it was easy, as easy as releasing our physical weapons. We have insidious tools that aren't quite as tangible, that breed war, tools like inequality, dehumanization, hate, complacency, cynicism, apathy, division, and inaction. These tools are so difficult because they're so hard to see, name, and change. They can live inside of each one of us and they can grow to build structures and systems. And it's hard to realize they are even there. How do we transform these intangible weapons inside and around us that destroy human life? How can we grow into tools of peace and hope? Isaiah shows us one way how, by continually seeking to learn God's ways, by walking in God's path, by attempting and striving to live in unity, to work for God's justice, and to disarm ourselves, making gifts of service and community out of what was once used to injure. You might say, well, those are nice words, but this passage of peace isn't realistic. This will only happen when Christ comes. Maybe we will never see God's peace come into fruition in our lifetime, but friends, this vision is what we are called to work toward. One of my mantras when I'm praying is, God, bring peace, peace that passes all understanding to be in this situation. God's peace has the power to enter us in situations beyond our control and in ways we cannot fully describe to bring us peace. I know that God's peace might not fix every situation, but I also trust that God's peace will rest on all of those affected, is with those affected to help us overcome the impossible. Friends, may we learn war no more. May we drop our swords, stones, guns, and bombs. May we gather our weapons and transform them and ourselves into instruments of peace. Friends, we are called to be teachers and students of God's path, restorers and recipients of God's justice, and co-workers of God's peace. May this school year we grow, learn, and transform to make it so. Amen. With that image, swords beaten into plowshares, the idea of us being turned into tools of God's peace, we borrow the words of a forebearer in the faith, Francis of Assisi, who wrote a prayer that's been used many, many times through the centuries. It begins, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. And so we'll let that be our refrain throughout our prayers of the people today. When you hear me say, gracious God, hear our prayers, I invite you to respond and make us instruments of your peace. Our prayer, the beginning and end of which are uh, based on the rest of that longer prayer by Francis. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, let us so pardon. Where there is doubt, let us so faith. 
Where there is despair, let us sow hope. Where there is darkness, let us sow light. Where there is sadness, let us sow joy. Gracious God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. In a time of discord and division, when the world seems ripped apart, we pray, O oh God, for unity. We pray for eyes to see neighbors instead of enemies. We pray that you would empower the church with the ministry of reconciliation to bind together what is broken, divided, and at odds with one another. Gracious God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. In a time of violence, as wars are fought around the globe and violence continues to fill our news feeds at home, when we become almost immune to the taking of life, God, move us from apathy. Inspire us to action. Help us to care and to make decisions in ways that are responsible and guided by your vision of peace and justice. Gracious God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. In a time of destruction, as the waters roar and foam, as the power of nature brings an end to life and livelihood, particularly for those in the wake of Hurricane Laura, our neighbors in Texas and Louisiana and the rest of our country affected by this great storm. God, we pray for strength. We pray for neighborly love. We pray for generosity for those who reach out to care and to give in times of need. Gracious God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. In a time of fear and frustration, as the coronavirus continues to loom as a dark cloud over us, at times eclipsing even our sense of light, God, we pray for your light to shine even in the darkness. We pray that you would give us vision and insight to see who we are and what we are called to do, even in this time where it feels like we cannot do so much. Continue to use us as the body of Christ, reaching out to an aching world. God, hear our prayers and make us instruments of your peace. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console others in their suffering, that we might seek not so much to be understood as to understand our neighbors, especially those who are vastly different than ourselves. Grant that we may seek not so much to be loved as to love all your children. For in giving we receive, in pardoning we are pardoned, and in dying we are born to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in singing, Today We All Are Called to Be Disciples, which is printed in the online bulletin and in the blue hymnal at number 434.
of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 